Gen 2 Galil Ace topped with the Gen 2 UH1 Huey. Going for it, baby. Ooh, that thumps on that target. <laughs> So what are the improvements to the Gen 2 Ace and is it any better than the Gen 1? That's the question, the, the questions that we're going to, uh, to answer here today. So I got my first reps on the Gen 1 Ace several years ago when IWI asked if I'd like to shoot one at the Red October Kalashnikov Championship. I chose the 5.56 version because at the time adding any optic to the top of it uh, puts you in open division. And because it used Stanag magazines in the 5.56, that means I could also use like a D60 on that. And I figured if I was gonna be in open, I might as well go full open on it. So I kind of did. Comp, optic, sweet stock from Dissident Arms and uh, Stanag mags with a D60 that we can't show you on YouTube. So I shot this gun for several years um, in AK matches, couple three gun club matches and other different events. And IWI used the feedback from myself, other competition shooters, operators, trainers, et cetera, people who know what they're doing. Um, and then they came up with the, the Gen 2, which we've got right here. And I'm actually really pumped to have one of these because uh, they make, did make some significant upgrades to it. And we're gonna talk about them here today. But first, I'd like to tell you where I got all this stuff. So the Galil Ace was, uh, the Gen 2 was provided to me by IWI uh, for this purpose. And then um, the UH1 Gen 2 that you see on top here was provided by Vortex Optics. Um, this does come with one PMAG. I bought several more and about a thousand rounds of ammunition. Currently round counts like 700 on here. Also in this video, you'll see me shooting it with this uh, Viper 5 to 25 that I use for uh, long range testing. And it is on the um, ADM Delta mount. And this was provided by Vortex and by ADM. And finally, you'll see me rocking the Isotune Sport calibers. Uh, ear protection. These were provided by Isotune Sport. They do support the channel and uh, grateful for that because it also protects my ears. Oh, and there's also a Magpul bipod in this video. I bought that. There's basically like three major differences on this Gen 2 compared to the Gen 1. And uh, basically we're talking about like the stock, the lower receiver, and then the handguard. And so we'll start the back here. Stock, this is like a, just a Magpul CTR. Uh, typically what you would see on an AR platform. Um, not on an AK, but that is where the big upgrade has happened. So this trunnion right here now accepts a AR buffer tube. So you can put any sort of AR stock on here you want. Again, this is a CTR, it did come with the rifle. It's what comes on them from the factory. Uh, but having the AR uh, adapter on there makes, makes it so you can put like, uh, you know, hundreds of stocks on, on this thing because that they're all AR platform now. Uh, it does come with a cheek piece, which I like the cheek piece. If you're going to put any sort of AR height optic on here, it does need, or for me, it does need a cheek piece. Um, the old Galil Ace, the Gen 1, came with a iron sights. This one does not. It's flat top all the way out. So that cheek piece is a must, and it's good that it came with it. Now, the cool thing about having that trunnion on there from the factory, instead of getting an adapter aftermarket, is that keep the foldy boy. And the Foldy Boy is kind of cool because it does uh, put this in a more compact package. It actually does fit in a bag that I have for it. And it does fire completely collapsed. Yeah. <laughs> Call that emergency only. 
So the charging handle is on the left side of the receiver, as typical with the Galil Ace, um, which is honestly nice, right? Because you don't have to take your hands off of fire control. You don't have to rock it under there for AK style. It does come with this nice dust cover that moves back and forth as the charging handle reciprocates. And the charging handle does reciprocate during fire. I haven't had any problems of it running into anything because it is well out of, well out of the range of my arm. The safety lever and the other safety lever seem very similar to what was on the Gen 1. All right, so we got safety options on this. Herc, have you shot one of these before? I've not. So safe, fire. Or safe, fire. Ah. But I don't think my thumb's big enough for that one or long enough. It's just, it's not comfortable. Okay. So I'll probably use the index. Do you think that if you can use your thumb for the safety, it'll be faster? Yeah. Because your trigger finger will be right there. Mm -hmm. But for me, like, I can, I can reach that, but it doesn't for, put my thumb in a comfortable position. Yeah. Once I'm done. The, the other one just seemed kind of clunky. Yeah, so it's not horrible, but it didn't seem as fast. The receiver, like I said, is a big upgrade as well. So the bottom receiver is plastic. That's, you know, the, lo the typical lower receiver. That is not the serialized part. The serialized part is this machined steel uh, receiver. Very strong, very durable. There is some nice IWI branding on this uh, grip right here. It does look a lot like the Masada pistol, and it makes it... Um, it makes it really fit into that corporate identity. I think it does have access for uh, something inside, looks like right here. I don't have anything to poke it with. Let's try that. So the handle does have access to store things in there. And there's a flat fastener inside, flat head screwdriver fastener. The other major part about this receiver that's different is that there was a plastic piece right here that was kind of like a magazine well. Um, I can find a picture of it. I'll put it up on the screen right here. But that was something that definitely got in the way for a lot of shooters. I personally did not have a lot of time on it, so it wasn't a problem with me. Um, but I know a lot of people actually did cut that plastic part out, like with a hacksaw. And so on the Gen 2, it's just completely missing uh, right there. And so it's just exposed steel here. It does have that typical recess in there that you would expect with an AK, as well as the tab on the magazine. And it's the typical rock and lock with the lever that you can actuate with either the mag or your thumb. And the biggest update in my opinion is the free float handguard. Now this is a free float handguard. It has two fasteners, one on either side that's, uh, that are drilled through the receiver that are holding it in place there, as well as this fastener and um, I guess kind of a nut and bolt sort of thing. And it's clamping it on the bottom right there. Super steady, cannot move it at all, not even a little bit. Um, and then it has a flat bottom, which is great for bracing on barricades or off of a, a car yeah. rooftop, simulated rooftop, stuff like that. Yeah. And just an absolute abundance of M-lock on here. So lots of options to mount things. Um, and then a full rail on top for flashlights, laser beams, all kinds of other cool stuff, backup iron sides if you're into that. It does also have a QD in the, um, the uh, handguard itself, as well as a QD cup back here on the CTR for stock options, <laughs> for sling options. <laughs> um, typically when, uh, when I'm running in a competition, I'll have a uh, two point sling and I'll run it on the front and the back of the, the gun. Self-defense type of purposes, I do usually use the one on the stock and then I'll put um, a QD cup right here on the, uh, on the receiver, or excuse me, on the handguard. There is one more sling point right here for single point, single point sling stuff or whatever. If you have an old style sling with a little hook and little hook kind of thing. And then the barrel is cold hammer forged and chrome lined, very sturdy, very stout uh, with a bird cage flash hider that works pretty well. Now, like I said, the, the handguard is free float. I don't know if you consider the barrel free float because it does have that uh, long stroke op rod that is in there. I don't know, you tell me, is that free float? I, I, 
I'd say it's as free float as you're gonna get for an AK, but I don't know if that's technically free float, so, but the handguard is, so what do I know? Last thing on the barrel right here, it's one in 9.45 inches twist. 9.45, that's very specific. Usually you see one in eight, one in 10, but one in 9.45. I wonder how they came up with that specific number, but that's pretty cool. All right, so how does it shoot? That is a good question. It actually shoots really well. So the 7.6239 does have like a, a pronounced thump to it. It is definitely more raucous than like your, your typical three gun tuned um, AR-15. But that said, it's not unmanageable. It does require a little more discipline in getting behind the gun, pushing the um, your shoulder forward and getting a good stance, but it's not something that can't be overcome. The, <laughs> the long stroke piston system has that ka-chunk, ka-chunk uh, when it operates and is very, very satisfying. So that's pretty cool. So now again, when you put like an AR height optic on here, uh, you do have to be aware that the mechanical offset is a little bit different than you're typically used to with like the AR platform and different than you typically used to with an AK when you're only shooting iron sights or a lower optic. Huh, interesting. Let's see, the triangle on the Huey bottom on an AR, that is the uh, holdover. So close quarter battle, that's your zero. Okay. On this, it's like three inches below that. Now I've got a decade of experience shooting ARs in like three gun matches, two gun matches, other carbine type stuff on the AR platform. Uh, some also with the uh, Gen 1 Galil Ace, which takes Stan Ag mags. But this was my first extended experience with the Rock and Lock 762 by 39 AK pattern magazines. Um, I think all my all of my testing was done with the P mags, so I don't know if it's any different, but. It was definitely something to get used to. No, it's empty. I got my pocket load. Here we go. First one. And it wasn't too bad to nail that rock and lock when there was no time pressure. But as soon as I brought out the clock, the wheels kind of fell off a little bit. Stand by. <laughs> ah. Get in there. 742. What was it? 742. Oh my God. <laughs> After that range day, I did reach out to Kyle Litzy, who is the most dominant heavy division AK shooter on the uh, in the US right now. He's also competed in the Ipsic rifle world shoot, uh, albeit with an a AR platform. Uh, and I asked him for some advice on how to effectively change magazines. And this is what he said. I've won a lot of matches doing it this way. So I do the magazine kick out method where I hit the magazine release with my next mag, follow through, dropping the mag, and then I'll come in at an angle, like a 45 degree angle upward, and lock it in. It's also really not a bad way to do it with your thumb, where you kick the mag out of your thumb and load it, but when you're running around uh, and you're winded, shooting a match, nervous, or fighting, or whatever the f is going on, uh, I find it takes a lot less dexterity to come up with a magazine, smash it into the bottom of the trigger well, or the end of the, of the trigger guard, and flick a mag out. So of the two ways that Kyle outlined, I did like the, the smack method with the, uh, the magazine on uh, operating the release. My friend Sean that I brought out was using his thumb. Woo, 489, baby. Right. So are you a smacker or a thumber? Leave a comment below and let me know. While you're at it, maybe subscribe to the channel as well. That'd be cool. So I did take it out to shoot some long range and I did put the Viper 5 to 25 on there with the in the ADM Delta mount. I use this scope on all my long guns that are gonna get an LPVO or a red dot. And the reason I do that is then I can see what the gun will mechanically do um, as far as accuracy goes when you reduce the human error of like the dot bouncing around and it just gives you a little bit more fidelity. It actually shoots pretty well long range for the ammunition that I had. So I had just some ste cheap steel case stuff and I was able to uh, get a group of about a minute or less at 100 yards. 
And that's actually much better than I expected. This is a very rigid barrel and a good, uh, a good stable platform, but the trigger has a really long pull and the brake is, is uh, not substantial. There's not much of a wall. I wouldn't call it the best for long range shooting, but that's not what the gun's intended for. It's intermediate, it's uh, um, more of a, a battle rifle type thing. The groups are not that great, but we are shooting just plain old steel case, junk ammo. But still, we're gonna try to shoot 400 yards. So let's see if we can hit that 100 yard steel real quick. Yep. There we go. There we go. <clears throat> All right. So that was 100. Let's see if we can hit 200. Boom. Nailed it. Lower third of the plate. I missed that time. There we go. Okay, moving on to 300. I don't know what the drop is out here, but there should be some drop. Yeah, wind's really starting to play out at 300. So that was off to the right. Got him. So out to 300, no problem. Let's see if we can get 400. But let's change up the position a little bit <clears throat> and uh, see if we can shoot from a barricade or something. In the last like six or seven years that AK matches have been around, the the targets are getting farther and farther away. So the, the farthest I heard of this year was 350 yards at like the Red October um, Cold War that is in Arizona. And that was on a full size IPSC. So the shooting that I did was on much more reduced targets and I was able to get out to uh, 100, 200, 300. Yeah, I think this might be mild steel. <laughs> 400. And I did pick the absolute windiest day to try it. Hit. All right. So with some better ammo, maybe one of the Hornady match rounds or something like that, and uh, a more calm day, I'm sure it'll shoot much better groups than uh, sub minute. But again, sub minute's like pretty dang good, especially for uh, an AK match when you're shooting big targets anyway. And I wanted to just show this comparison to the AR-15 uh, platform. You can kind of see the overall length, but they do both have Magpul CTR stocks. And you can see that it's much farther out on the AR-15. And that is because of the receiver length on the AK. The receiver length on the AK is much, much longer than the AR. Um, and that causes me to push in that stock as much as possible. And it does give a nice hand position on the grip. Uh, the optic is very far out, so it gives me a nice open field of view. Feature plans wise, I do have some more ammunition on the way for this. I'm gonna finish up that thousand rounds and I think I do have another 500 uh, to go through as well for this match season here. So I'll report back on how that does. And like I said, I do have some upgrades that I'm going to be doing to it. So I'll keep you in the loop on that one as well. So if you've been thinking about getting the Gen 2 Galil Ace and you didn't know, you got my seal of approval on it. I've really enjoyed having this thing right here and I'm looking forward to shooting it some more. But that is the important thing is getting out and actually shooting a match. So if you've ever wanted to uh, know how to set up a rifle for a running gun, I got a video on doing that right here. And if you want to set up your rifle for a three gun match, you can do that right here. Thanks for watching.